today on Executive Report, we have got one of the most well-connected people in all of Maryland, Mike Tisch. He's going to talk to us about how we can increase our networks and foster relationships that help us both personally and on the business level. So make sure you hit that like button and subscribe. Stay tuned. So today we are blessed to have Mike Tish on the show. So welcome. blessed, blessed, absolutely. <laughs> sure, let's go with blessed. <laughs> so Mike, you've uh, you are a longtime Baltimore native. Um, I've often called you the Great Connector. Mm -hmm. It seems like you know everyone. If there's someone I want to be introduced to or to like to meet, I, I come to you first. And not only do you know them, but chances are you've known them for 20 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you truly are the Great Connector. And in that time being in Baltimore, you've uh, started many companies. You've you've run them, you've sold them, exited them. Um, as of late, you run a group called Insight, uh, which is kind of a peer advisory group. Correct. And then a group that's uh, that's more of a networking group called Correct. Insight Connects. Correct. And um, you've just done so much in the, in this particular um, community that we had to have you on the show. So yes, Thank you. we Thank are you. blessed. And I don't do this. So this is not a thing I do. So <laughs> I know. So I'll apologize up front. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, I'm really curious. You're like a walking CRM. <laughs> Seriously, right. how do you maintain so many relationships? How do you build them? I mean, is it, it's like your superpower. How do you do it? Well, I think you, for me anyway, I, I, I'm a true believer that business is not business, okay. that, that business is personal. And I don't think it's just a tagline that I've used. I think it's just the way I'd, I've, I've always lived my life. Hmm. So for good or for bad, I tend to get into people's lives and meet them where they are. Okay. Perfect example is uh, during COVID, we did a mobile insight thing hmm. where I would take a roll of paper towels, a roll of toilet paper, and a bottle of wine to my clients' homes. <laughs> they didn't want to meet. They were sick and tired of Zoom. Yeah. Um, I really wasn't comfortable meeting people in person in an enclosed place. Outside works better. Mm -hmm. And what better than a roll of toilet paper? If you guys remember, <laughs> that do. toilet paper was a problem, right? It was. For a while. So um, I just try to meet people where they are. I've been to too many funerals. I've been to too many bar mitzvahs. I've been to too many weddings. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that there are very few people that actually care about people's lives as much as their business. Yeah. This is not about business. Got so it. not only making it personal, but living it. Yeah, living the mantra. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, and like I said, you, I think a lot of the people that you're associated with feel that same way. Um, everyone that you've introduced me to has the idea that relationships supersede the finances. And um, I think the most successful people have that same, that same concept. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you'll get into it, but I, I did things in reverse. My first business was the most successful. <laughs> so at 32, I was retired. And at 32, after selling a Whoa, company, you were retired at 32. I did, I did. <laughs> my, my first company, I started it at 24 and, and blew it up to a couple hundred employees and and 20 million dollars in sales and sold it, and I retired. And so, what'd you do though? I mean, you're 32. Did you just have empty space? I mean, how'd you handle it? It's that? a funny story, and, and you'll you'll get it because um, I didn't do anything. <laughs> so I started taking my kids to school, the the exact same school your daughter goes to. Yep. And as you know. Pick up at that school is one big pain in the neck. <laughs> it and is. these for people that don't know, this school that if you get picked up at what two fifty or two thirty, two thirty, yeah, you got to get there by one o'clock because the blue haired ladies will be there, yeah, by one o'clock. So I became the blue haired lady picking my kids up from school, <laughs> and a gentleman in town that's an FBI agent knocked on my window one day and said, "What the hell are you doing here? You're thirty two years old, you drive a nice car, and you're here every day. Are you?" A drug dealer. Just tell me. <laughs> You're doing something and, under the yeah. table. So that led me to like, you know, it's not healthy for my kids to see me sitting at home doing carpool at 32 years old. <laughs> I can understand. So that, um, you know, it, but a lot of those relationships came from some of those, my kids and my yeah. kids' schools and Got it. You know, Baltimore, it's a small town. It is. It is. So for the, for those of us that are in, uh, you know, different cities and different countries and different states, uh, when people ask where you went to school in Baltimore, they're not talking about your college. They're talking about your high school. Oh, yeah. And chances are that their same kids went to similar high schools. They all played athletics together. It's, it's a crazy small town feel here. Yeah. It's, it's not even a feel. I, I've lived in a lot of places and I've lived in Atlanta. I've lived in Milwaukee and my first business was in Milwaukee, but I never would 
sell my house in Baltimore. I came yeah. back on the weekends. And as much as I traveled the world in my in my door business days, um, there is something about Baltimore as a place that is unlike any place else. That's for sure. So so let me go back to that, by yeah, the way. Sure. Been, so you started this business in your 20s, yeah. um, and you, you blew it up, you sold it, retired. But during that time when you started your business, um, how was it? What was life like for Mike Tish when you decided to step out and, uh, and be your own boss? Yeah, it was hell. <laughs> um, I had invented a product okay. that I took to my best friend, who I did not know was the son of a billionaire. Oh, okay. So I had a mentor, um, a guy named Bill Kellogg, who uh, started a little company called Kohl's Department yeah. Store, and Bill became my mentor. And I had whatever I wanted, but I wasn't prepared at 24 years old to experience employees dying, oh, wow. which we did. Um, I had an employee whose face was broken. I didn't know there was such a thing. Um, and dealing with labor that I, I just wasn't, I, I had a great product. I and I was the ultimate evangelist for that product, but I wasn't prepared to run a business. I was just a son that from a guy that went to Essex Community College, a little community college here in Baltimore. I wasn't prepared. I had great mentors, but I don't think that you're prepared to run a business until you run a business. Understood. It's so one of those was, things you don't know what you don't know. It was right? purely baptism by fire. <laughs> Sounds like there were some pretty hard times then. There were some hard times. Yeah. I, I remember sitting in a, in a hotel in, in Pennsylvania with my partner and we just had a, a, someone hurt on the door hmm. and it was at Kroger in Cincinnati. And I couldn't believe that I had somebody die working on one of my products. I just couldn't believe it. Wow. And it was probably the lowest point of all, but at the end of the day as an entrepreneur, you don't have a choice. I had two kids at home. Yeah. And I was, a, I, I'm not from the right side of the streets. You know, we grew up um, on the wrong side of the streets and there was no choice but to push through. To keep going, right? Yeah, there's no choice. Absolutely, you have to. And it's funny, we um, we had a guest on the show previously that talked about entrepreneurs and they don't know just how much further they have to go before they succeed. And sometimes they give up, you know, the day before usually, their big break happens. Usually, yeah. And now in, in my business, I get to spend my whole life with uh, between 130 and 150 entrepreneurs. And it, it isn't work. Yeah. Because I get to live my life now through them. And um, get back in a way that uh, most people don't get to do. <laughs> so with that being said, yeah. I, I do n believe that oftentimes it's the struggles and, and sometimes even the failures that shape who we are and help create success for us in the future and moving forward. Do you have any memories of back in those days where you thought, oh, man, what the hell did I do? Why, why would I even make that decision? Yeah. So but now you look back and it's kind of funny. So it was Walmart. And Walmart came to us and came to me and wanted us to produce a door that we never produced. Okay. It was a low cost door and, and not to get too deep into the woods with the door, but I invented a door you couldn't break. Hmm. And if you go to any major fortune 500 company, uh, TKO doors is, is in about 490 of those, okay. of those companies. And Walmart wanted something cheap because they're Walmart and Walmart, when they say what to do, you do it. Yep. And we took a purchase order for 357 doors. I'd only built one. And it was at a price point that was probably not real smart. Um, but again, if you wanted to get into retail, you had to get into Walmart. Got it. And the thought was if Walmart would buy from you, then anybody would. So bit the bullet. And uh, there were some bad times. We had to empty our entire production facility. Everybody put them on buses and had to call Water, Michigan to install 357 doors. There was nobody there. Wow. Admin people were putting up doors because we couldn't get anyone to do it because nobody had ever seen this kind of door before. Wow. So it ended up being a high point because Walmart ended up being 40 or 50% of our company. <laughs> um, but the first project was really difficult. <laughs> Lots of lessons learned there. Lots of lessons learned, right. <laughs> and um, and as you're growing, I mean, if you get an order from Walmart, like you said, mm -hmm. you, you, you take it and then you figure it out later. Um, did you Did you promote people? Um, did you react in ways that maybe you shouldn't have with uh, bringing people in? Yeah, it's it's funny you say that, and and I tell the story all the time. But we had a gentleman that that worked in the shop, and he was amazing. Okay, and we promoted him uh, beyond his level of expertise. <laughs> okay, and he was the employee of the year for our company, and three weeks later he was gone. Wait, wait, um, he, wait, he, you like he quit or you fired him? We we fired him. 
<laughs> yeah, because he, he went from uh, being a production manager to sitting at his desk drinking beer at 8 o'clock in the morning with his feet up. I don't even know where I got the beer, but oh my it was Milwaukee, so beers, you can get that anywhere, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it, we promoted people that shouldn't have been promoted. We, we ended up making every mistake in the book, every mistake. <laughs> but I was a kid, right? Well, fair enough. And, and the, the mentors, there's something cool about having a mentor that was on the Forbes list of 343 at the time. But you don't make the call to a guy that's worth one and a half billion dollars about a shop superintendent. You don't do it. <laughs> you, you, you only make that call for really big things. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Which is why I called you for this. You make the call for the big things. Right? There you go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, you know, I'm a big believer in what you said earlier, that business is about relationships mm-hmm. and it is personal. And anyone that says it's not personal, in my opinion, doesn't doesn't have a connection with their clients, their relationships, or their employees. For that it's, matter. it's business is business. And it's, it's not personal until somebody does something to you that you don't like, that hurts, that, that at the end of the day, I truly believe that everything in business is personal. And I'm not a believer in a transactional business. Mm-hmm. Everybody says, well, I ask all the time, what's a transactional business? Well, let's say Amazon. Amazon's a great transactional business until they screw up your package. Mm-hmm. Not, not, too, uh, not too transactional then. That's a good point. So I, I have yet to find a business that, that doesn't have a personal aspect to it. And to me, the core of everything I do is, is, is the personal aspect. No, that, that makes sense. So when COVID hit in 2020, mm-hmm. um, you, you've got this networking group that's personal in, in person. Um, you've got this peer advisory group that's, again, in person. How are you able to keep you know people, um, I guess you could say, intimate with one another, so to speak, yeah. uh, in, in the midst of not being able to meet? So I'll just go on the record. I hate Zoom. <laughs> I can't stand it, and I don't like it. Okay. And I think that... It, it worked okay for the peer business. It did not work for the networking slash relationship development business. Okay. So I gave everybody back their money. Okay. I shut it down. I'm sure they appreciated that too. Um, there were other people in the world that were trying to fit the, the round circle into the square hole and make it fit. I didn't, I couldn't take money from people that were expecting to have in-person one-on-one type relationships and then do it by Zoom. I wouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. So it, it cost me a couple hundred thousand dollars to write those checks, but I did. Um, at the end of the day, when things came back, everybody came back. Yeah. And when you're born and raised in a place, and I'm 54, I'm 56 years old, sorry. <laughs> Always think I'm 54. I'm 56 years old, old and I've, I've been born here. You don't screw people in a small town. No. You just don't. That's right. And there were a lot of people, out-of-towners, as I say, they were taking people's money and trying to do things. Hmm. Um, I, I didn't. Now, now, luckily, I'm. You get back to we're blessed. Yeah. Luckily, I I had the ability to do that, and some people don't. That's true. But I was able to just turn it off, pause it, and a lot of people were doing business together. I had people coming to me saying, "Why aren't you taking our money?" Like we're doing business together. It, there's, you're still performing a function. Yeah, it's not what I promised you. Interesting. So, no, I do. I, I use the word blessed all the time, and it, it's an interesting point. Uh, that you said you were able to give back the money they invested. Um, th- that leads me to believe, that, like me, you're probably not a big believer in corporate debt. Yeah, you and I have had this conversation before. <laughs> um, I I don't believe in debt, period. Yeah. Um, again, I'm blessed, right? Yeah. I sold a business at a young age. I paid off the house and I, I bought a place at the beach. <laughs> um, I drive the same car. I've had the same house for 25 years. And yeah. I, I, I'm not a believer in debt. I, I think it makes sense for some businesses. But um, I just think there's something about going to sleep at night knowing you don't owe anyone anything. Mm-hmm. I, I think it allowed me and has allowed me over the years to make decisions that I don't have to worry about whether that bank loan or the mortgage or or being in over my head. Yeah. But again, I grew up with nothing. Yeah. So it, I, it's easy for me. Yeah. I was very happy being poor. Well, there seems to be a pretty, you know, pretty big line in the sand because a lot of startups, I mean, that is how they operate. It's all based on debt and investment um, where other companies, they, they want nothing to do it, do with it. There's not too many people that say, yeah, it has its place and we'll get out of it when we can. Yeah. It's funny you mention it. My, my son, who is a, uh, just got named at Forbes magazine, 30 under 30. Wow. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Yeah. He, um, he's a, a founder of a startup in Silicon Valley where he lives with his wife and my granddaughter. And, they celebrate raising money. 
I, I don't get that. <laughs> like, I don't get the fact we celebrate now we're further in debt. I just don't get it. Yeah. But in that world, that's what they do. That's what they do. Yeah. Got it. And him and I have had this conversation a million times. Be careful. You know, so, what, sudden, so it is his opinion on it. You said he celebrates it, but uh, does he want to be out of it at some point? Well, yeah. I mean, that's the, that's why you start him, I think. But uh, at the end of the day, you get caught up in it. Hmm. You get caught up in that world where it's all about raising money. And their startup was actually profitable last year, hmm. which okay. for a fast growing, they're in a Y Combinator program, which is a pretty cool program. Um, but they've actually concentrated on we're going to still make money. There's nothing wrong with being profitable and raising money. No, that's true. But most don't. That is very true. Um, I've actually done case studies on a lot of the businesses that go on to Shark Tank, if uh, if you're familiar with the show. And most of them don't make money uh, if within the first three to five years. Uh, I remember one specifically uh, called Plated. Uh, and five years later, they were doing almost $80 million, $90 million in revenue, and they had yet to make a profit. And I just found that you know, crazy. You know, how can you do that revenue without making profits and not plan for it? Especially when you have an investor. I think the investor from Shark Tank. So I'm going to interview for a second. Who's your favorite Shark Tank shark? Oh, probably Kevin O'Leary. Mr. Mr. Wonderful. Wonderful. (laughs) That's right. Mr. Wonderful. Um, What I like about him most is he makes everything very black and white. You know, it either is or isn't. And he's very upfront and honest with the people that are there trying to raise money. And um, sometimes it's hard to listen to if you're one of those companies. But at the end of the day, you know exactly where you stand and you know exactly where his opinion is of the business. I think he's a little too much TV for me. Okay. I like Barbara Corcoran. I think that she... um I think that she truly gets into the into the lives of her entrepreneurs. She does. You're right. So, she yeah. absolutely does. Big fan of the show, though. Are you? <laughs> I I have to get back to watching, and I haven't seen it in quite a while. Yeah, I, I watch it every day. So, 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 really quick, um, back to to one of my questions. Um, I've heard a lot of people use the phrase "your net worth is in your network," and uh, I think you're a great example of that. At least my opinion of net worth, because I think your net worth is much more than, you know, the the dollars and cents that you have in your bank account. I think it is about the relationships. It's about the people that you've helped. Um, It's it's about, you know, the businesses that you've helped form and been a mentor for other people. So I'm curious what your opinion is. Do you believe it? I I believe it, but I I don't like the word networking. Okay. So I am a big believer in developing relationships, and I will do that with Anybody from the janitor to whomever within a company. Okay. Um, I a lot of times we hear about companies that have minimums. I can't deal with X, Y, Z because you know they're too small for me, mm-hmm. and I, I bring it up all the time. Many people told Kevin Plank no, and now he's the CEO of Under Armour in a mm-hmm. multi-billion-dollar company. Many people told Bill Kellogg no, we're not going to deal with Coles because you only have three stores. Well, now I did $36 billion in sales. Yep. So to me, I think networking makes it look like, okay, we're here to get something from them. Okay, I'm much more interested in in relationship working. And I don't know what the word for that is, but of, of really getting to know people. And I think you can learn as much from sometimes the janitor as you can from the CEO. So I would agree with that. Sometimes uh, maybe even more. I, I find it more interesting. And you know, as as you know, I'm a, a a big NFL fan, and I will I will sit all day long with anyone and talk about NFL football and college <laughs> basketball. So, got it. So, if you had one piece of advice for an entrepreneur or someone that's about to start a business, especially in the the climate that we're in now, uh, what would you tell them? Yeah, I think be true to who you are at your core. Okay. And you'll the big thing with me now is talking about at your core. You'll hear a lot more about it from from me and from us that try to be true to who you are. And not everybody has to scale. A lot of people use the word, I want to scale. And what they really mean is I want to make more money. Hmm. The two don't have to work that way. That I think, figure out what you want and and, and go for it. And it doesn't have to be, not everybody has to be the next Amazon. Not everybody has to be the next Walmart. Hmm. There's there's nothing wrong with having a non-scalable business that can make money. So... Don't apologize for making money because there's nothing wrong with it. Came up today with 10 CEOs, and we were talking about a pastor, a pastor in town that drives a Rolls Royce. And somebody came up and said, wait a minute. He's an entertainer. He's a finance person. 
He owns the building. He took a risk. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong. That pastor should not be apologize, apologizing for making money when at the end of the day, yeah. they're part of his world is business. That's not true. all of it, because again, business is personal, yeah. but embrace it and uh, just go for it. So just embrace who you are. This is not a dress rehearsal. <laughs> well, Mike, I thank you so much for joining us. And I will use the term blessed. We are blessed to have you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for being a friend, a mentor, and everything you've been for us. And uh, hopefully we can have you back again. Anytime. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, out in uh, YouTube world and on the podcast. Uh, we appreciate your listening. So make sure you click that subscribe button, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Mm -hmm.